And so uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Judge Reggie B. Walton, who has uh, an enormous bio, of which we always say, but I would like to say that uh, he hails from a place called the home of champions. So he should have been, uh, in essence, an athlete, but he turned out to be an athlete on the bench. He comes from uh, Donora, Pennsylvania, where Ken Griffey Sr., Stan uh, Musil, and other fine athletes come from. He took another route uh, and became um, a jurist, but also someone who had a meteoric rise. Uh, you recognize him because he says that he's tough on crime, but he understands the failings, the frailties in mandatory sentencing. And he certainly understands, as the youngest and first deputy drug czar under drug czar Bennett, uh, that there are many ways, in essence, to get to the bottom of this question. One, you can say no. You can travel across the country and say how deadly it is, but at the same time, uh, it is important for you to recognize other ways. Let me finish by just suggesting to you that in his career, he became the chief of the career criminal unit in the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1979, and during his time uh, in that position, he never lost a case. So I really want him to be supporting uh, looking again at mandatory minimums. Uh, at the age of 32, he was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the D.C. Superior Court, uh, the second youngest judge ever appointed to the district bench. We're delighted to have you, Judge Walton, and we thank you for your viewpoint. Welcome. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Congresswoman. I uh, actually was an athlete, and I was inducted into the Western Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame last weekend. <laughs> But I, I, I do commend uh, the Congressional Black Caucus for hosting this discussion because I think it is essential that we address the issue of the disparity between crack and uh, powder uh, cocaine sentencing uh, because I think it's essential that we do so for the health of our criminal justice system. The decision to adopt the disparity between crack and powder cocaine I don't believe was predicated on a desire to have a racist result as a, as, as a result of that disparity, but that uh, has in fact been uh, the consequences. The decision to adopt the disparity was predicated on false assumptions, as you've heard. It was predicated on the belief that there was a different chemical makeup between the two substances, and we now know that that's not true. It was also predicated on the belief that crack cocaine was more addictive than uh, powder cocaine, and we now know that that is not also true. We do know, however, that the manner in which crack cocaine is injected may cause it to be more addictive, but as far as its chemical qualities are concerned, it is the same substance. Uh, we also know that there was a belief that uh, the unborn child would be uh, uh, greater subjected to addiction as a result of crack cocaine, and again, we know that that's not true. And we also uh, operated on the false predicate that uh, there was a greater level of violence associated with crack, and that justified the distinction. Now, admittedly, back in the 80s, uh, there was a greater level uh, of, of violence associated with crack cocaine in certain communities, uh, but that now is not the case. I see no greater level of uh, violence surrounding the crack trade than I see, than I see uh, the violence surrounding other types of drugs. So the predicates for uh, the distinction deaths don't exist anymore and uh, were false from the inception in many regards and therefore it is now time to act. Uh, what is the impact of that disparity? I think it has created some real dilemmas uh, for our criminal, criminal justice system and the respect that many people have uh, for our criminal laws. There is a belief that our laws are uh, racially motivated and even though these laws that we're talking about may only apply in the context of uh, drug prosecutions, there are many people who believe that because these laws are racist that they impact uh, how other laws are enacted and implemented. And I think it's a tragedy when you have a significant portion of one's society, including a significant racial portion of our society, who believe that our laws are not fair and they're unjust. Also, I've personally experienced situations where jurors, potential jurors, uh, will not sit. They uh, candidly will say 
uh, that I believe that the drug laws are not fair and therefore I will not be a, a, a party to seeing another young black man locked up for a long period of time and they refuse to sit. We also know that jury nullification uh, plays a, a factor in people not being willing to convict despite the weight of the evidence and I think those consequences have dire uh, effects uh, on the credibility that our justice system has. Um, I, I, I think the time is now for us to change uh, these laws. Uh, the Sentencing Commission did what it could do and uh, altered the sentencing guidelines uh, within the confines of what it could do based upon uh, existing legislation. And the ball now does rest uh, in the court uh, of the Congress. And I'm dismayed, I must say. Uh, I've testified several times, uh, three times to be exact, before Congress. It's been several years that this issue has been on the table, but yet Congress has not uh, seen fit to address the issue. And I haven't heard anybody really take an informed position that uh, the change should not occur. And I think it's a travesty that I am now sitting in court having to impose sentences that I know are fundamentally unjust uh, because Congress, for whatever reason, has not had the where wherewithal to act. The time is now if we're going to salvage the credibility that our citizens have for our criminal justice system, and I believe Congress has to act. It's essential that it occur, and that it occur now, not later. I do apologize for having to leave, but my wife is sitting in a restaurant waiting for me. And as much as I care about this issue, I also care about my marriage. <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, Judge, let me, uh, as we shake your hand, uh, let me just make a commitment. It is time for Congress to act. And thank you very much for challenging us in that manner. Thank you.